if we needed one. It is my pleasure to welcome Bernie Sanders, a quick bio. Born in Brooklyn, New York, he is the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress. First elected to the Senate in 2006, successfully re-elected in 12 and 18. He serves on five committees, including energy, the environment, health, education, labor, and probably dear to his heart, Veterans Affairs. He is a supporter of a progressive tax reform, Medicare for all, affordable housing, family farms, a higher minimum wage, workers' rights, and an improved energy policy. Prior to being in the Senate, he served in the House of Representatives, and before that, he was mayor of Burlington. He is married to his lovely wife, Jane. They have four children and seven grandchildren. It is my pleasure to welcome U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders to the DMA. from you and then to ask you questions. How, how's that, all right? Pretty good. All right. So let's start off. Here's my first question, my question to you. We don't have a lot of time, so don't be shy. Jump up and, and uh, respond. What are the issues on your minds that you think are most important for your lives, your family, and for the country? What are the issues that you guys are thinking about? Okay, we've got a hand right here. No, stand up, give us your name, please. Uh, I'm Elias Boy, and I would say one of the issues that is biggest for me is the workers' right to unionize and how how we address that. Good. Our workers' rights in general. Thank you very much for that question. And I'm gonna broaden that question by asking you this question. How is the economy doing now for working? families. Okay. How is the economy doing now for the very wealthy? Okay. So what you have is you are living in a society today <clears throat> which has more income and wealth inequality than any time in the history of America. So for people who are billionaires, they're making money hand over fist. For working people, people in the middle class, lower income people, they are falling further and further behind. So the issue that I wrestle with is how do you create an economy that works for all of us and not just extremely wealthy people? One of the ways that we do that, and I've been working really hard on it, is to make it easier for workers to join unions. All right, because when you have a union, you can negotiate decent wages on the job, decent benefit, decent working conditions. And we are working very hard on that. Give you an example. Starbucks has thousands and thousands of coffee shops all over America. Many of their workers in hundreds of shops are trying to organize. We are working with them against the company that is doing everything that it can to prevent them from unionizing. Amazon, same exact thing. So working hard on the issue is a very, very important issue. All right, now my question to you is if we're going to create an economy that works for all and not just the few, what are some of the things that we should be doing as a nation? What are we not doing that we should be doing? Don't be shy, let's go. I think you know the answers to these things. Come on, guys. You think about it. What should we be doing as a nation? Do I have oh, we got hands back down here? Yeah, stand up. Oh, you got a mic coming. Good um, I think we need, oh, I'm, I'm a Yansh, I'm a senior. Um, I think that we need to raise the minimum wage for those of us who have um, jobs that pay the minimum wage. How much do you make now? I, I work at a shopper. I make $12.50 an hour, okay. and I'm planning on putting myself through college. That's not enough to pay for college. Um, so I think that raising the minimum wage and making it a livable wage is Good. Really Excellent. Important. That's exactly one of the things that we've got to do. We are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. That's what we live in right now. But most of us don't know that 
because all the wealth is on top. 60%, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Who knows what I mean? And I grew up in a family that lived paycheck to paycheck. What do I mean by paycheck to paycheck? What does that mean? Raise your hand. Yeah, I've got a hand right here. Uh, hi, I'm Brandon Mazza. Um, I believe you mean um, living paycheck to paycheck, and not necessarily knowing where your next meal is going to come from. You don't know how you're going to make it through until your next paycheck. Right. That's right. In other words, you get a paycheck, you're working, and yet what you're earning is barely enough to keep you up, to pay the rent, to buy food, to take care of health care, whatever else you may need. You're going nowhere in a hurry, and sometimes you're falling further behind. In some states, not so much in Vermont, you have payday lenders. You know what a payday lender is? Anyone know what a payday lender is? What's a payday lender? Um, a payday lender is someone who will take, like, give, give you a loan on your next vacation. At outrageous interest rates, like 50%, 60 I mean, really what we call usurious interest rates. And desperate people are then forced to go to those places to borrow money to pay for healthcare, whatever, groceries or whatever else they need. All right, so what we are trying to do now is to fight for an economy that works for all. All right, so we talked about raising the minimum wage. I talked about so many people living in economic desperation, which means good paying jobs, all right? jobs that pay a livable wage. What else should we be doing? and many other countries are already doing when we talk about, broadly speaking, workers' rights, the rights of the middle class. Yes, stand up. My name's Dominic, I'm a senior. I would say, honestly, healthcare. Good, all right, what about healthcare? Is our healthcare situation in this country good right now? Why not? Raise your hand. Don, yep, stand up. It's honestly way too expensive. A lot okay. Of people can't afford it. Okay. Yep. Right hand, right here. Tell me about healthcare. Uh, I'm Naomi, and I think the big issue is big pharma taking more money than they need so that people can have medicine to just live. Good. Okay. Healthcare. What about it personal? Anyone want to talk about personal experiences, family experiences with healthcare? Yep. I see a hand right here. Right here. Okay. Hi, I'm Lauren, I'm a senior, and um, I went through physical therapy, and my shirts only covered five visits when I really needed more. Okay, good, 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 good example. Okay, other personal, yeah, I see a hand right here. Beth, hand right here. Oh, no, we got one. okay. Hi, I'm McKinley. Um, personally, to order medical supplies for myself, it's a very rigorous process because the healthcare system in this country is very outdated. Good. All right, other thoughts on healthcare, personal experiences? Yeah. Yep. Hi, my name is Olivia, and both my grandfather and my mother are diabetics, and they have to pay for their own medications, and that's very expensive because my grandfather, the, the um, money that he gets from the states is very enough to cover most of the medicines he needs. Okay. And diabetes is a major, major health problem throughout this country. Millions of people are diabetic. All right, let me say a word about health care. Uh, anybody here have any friends or relatives up in Canada? And if you get sick and you end up in the hospital in Canada, how much does it cost when you leave? Anyone know? Pretty much nothing. Zero. If you end up in the hospital in the United Kingdom, how much does it cost? Nothing. More or less, in most industrialized countries around the world, Healthcare is considered a right of all people and not just a privilege. So when you walk in the door today to this high school, did anyone at the front desk say, oh, it's gonna cost you 30 bucks to come in here, take out your credit card. You walk in the door to a publicly funded school. And all of you, regardless of the income of your parents, 
are considered equal. You're gonna get the same education based on your ability, and no one says you're rich, you're poor, everybody is treated the same. That's what we do with public education. In most countries in the world, that's what they do with healthcare. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor, you are entitled to healthcare as a human right. Why are we the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right? Who knows why? Let me get some more hands here. Think about it for a second. Who benefits if everybody thinks, and most Americans do, believe that the system is too expensive, too bureaucratic, too wasteful, why do we end up with the system? How did that happen? Yeah, I see a hand right here. Because the uh, healthcare system benefits the rich as a lot of things are more expensive. Well, it's not just the rich. It benefits who in particular? What industry loves the current system? Uh, privatized healthcare? Well, the private insurance companies. Your United Health, your Blue Cross Blue Shield. You're doing well. In many cases, these companies are making billions and billions of dollars a year, paying their CEOs outrageous. I mean, you can't believe how much money these guys make. So I'm private insurance, I'm doing really great. What's the problem? And those people who have all kinds of money put a lot of money into lobbying and into campaign contributions and into TV ads and so forth making it hard for us to make the transition to public health, which I would consider to be a, a Medicare for all, single payer system. So one of the major political struggles that we are having right now is to end the absurdity of us paying twice as much per capita for health care as any other country. We're spending $12,000 a piece for health care in America. That is double what almost any other country is paying. And the reason for that is it is a system, in my view, that benefits the insurance companies and the drug companies. Somebody there mentioned insulin. A couple of years ago, I took a trip with people in Michigan, across the border into Canada. We bought insulin for one-tenth the price that was paid here in the United States. One-tenth the price, same problem. And the reason is that in Canada, they negotiate prescription drug prices with the pharmaceutical industry. We are the only country that does not do that. We're beginning, we just passed legislation which just begins to do that, but way, way behind the rest of the world, which is why we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, all right? So when we talk about protecting working families, the middle class, it seems to me that healthcare has got to be something that all people are entitled to, high quality health care, at a cost that is affordable. Okay, what else? When we talk about the needs of working families, we talked about raising wages, talked about health care, what else is on your mind? What other issues that are out there? Don't be shy, guys. All right, I see a hand right back here. Yeah. Um, how much should the members of our law enforcement be paid? This nice gentleman across here. How much should they be paid? Uh, I was just in Rutland, and they were talking about that if you're a new police officer in Rutland, I believe it's like $25 an hour. Not a whole lot of money, in my view. Okay, other issues on how we protect the middle class and working families. All right, I see a hand, uh, you got a hand back there? All right. Yeah, good, all right. Oh, the bleach is there. My name is Carter, and I think one of the major problems is inflation and tax cuts. Okay, what do you want to extrapolate a little bit, talk a little bit about inflation and tax cuts? I think our inflation problems Horrible gas prices have been Good. increased right. horribly, and taxes should be cut. That's another problem with uh, universal health care is it would raise taxes. Okay, universal health care will cut the cost. All right, let me ask you this. Is Carter your name? Yes. Yeah, all right, Carter. 
When you have public health, as they do in every other country, it is true that it is paid for out of tax dollars. That's right. But what are you not paying for when you have public health? Private health care. Right. In other words, the employer right here, we'll just use Medicaid as an example. Your teachers have health insurance. It is paid for to, in this case, local folks have to pay for that bill. If your family has health insurance, they often have to pay private health insurance and out-of-pocket expenses, deductibles and co-payments and premiums. Businesses have to pay for health insurance for their workers. When you have a public health system, you don't have to do any of that. And at the end of the day, because we are spending twice as much, we spend about 12,000 a year, other countries, five, $6,000 a year, the average family actually would save money. No more private insurance, no more deductibles, no more copayments. Now you raise the issue of inflation, which is a very, very serious issue, all right? And people disagree, you know, as to what the causes of inflation are and how we solve it, but you're right. Going to the gas pump, uh, it is quite expensive right now. Who wants to speculate as to what are the causes of inflation? And I should tell you that honest people have different differences of opinion. First of all, is inflation just an American issue right now? No, it is a European issue, it is a global issue. In fact, in the United Kingdom, I was there last month, their inflation rate is 10% right now. So it's higher than it is in the United States, but it's very high in the United States. What are some of the reasons why inflation is high right now? Let me get some more hands out of you guys. Anyone have thoughts on it? All right, there are a few reasons. Number one, the pandemic, which obviously is global, has had an impact on production. When you have factories that are shut down because workers are not coming to work, that has an impact on the production of goods. Second of all, uh, what we are seeing is a breaking in supply chains, which means that if you're dealing with a product and they're not getting the elements that they need to make the product, it slows down production as well. And thirdly, what we are seeing is corporate greed at an unprecedented level. For example, you talked about uh, the high price of gas, which is true. Anybody here know how the oil industry is doing right now? How the big oil companies are doing? Are they making money or not? They are seeing record-breaking profits. Record-breaking profits. Talked about drug companies. Record-breaking profits. Food companies. Record-breaking profits. So one of the things that they have done in the midst of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, which has also had an impact on inflation, big impact, is they are jacking up prices to make money for themselves, in my view. So one of the things that we can do, and I've urged the president to do, is to go after the greed of these very large uh, corporations and pass what we call the windfall profits tax. And in the midst of this moment, when corporations are charging prices that are outrageously high, they should be taxed for their excessive profits. That will control, I think, the prices that they're charging. Uh, okay, any questions for me? I've asked you some questions. Yep, stand up. President Biden's pardon of those found um, with charges of possession of marijuana. Yes. Do you think that this is a step forward to decriminalization of marijuana in the United States? Yes, I do. Um, this country has, and, and let me tell you, you know, very often when I go to high schools, the issues of marijuana comes up. Everyone gets very excited about it, uh, and that worries me a little bit. To tell you the truth. But here's what I will say. Uh, the war on drugs, which was established many decades ago, I think most people now understand has been a failure. In other words, we still have to talk to the police chief in Rutland, talk to you know, people all over the country. We still have Burlington right now, a very serious problem with drugs for a variety of reasons. 
But what has happened in terms of the war on drugs is that a huge number of people have been arrested. And among people who are arrested are those who were smoking marijuana. Now, we can argue about the pros and minuses of marijuana. But I think what people recognize is that marijuana should not be classified. This is what the president did right now. Under federal law, you have what's called a Schedule One, which are the most dangerous drugs. Right now, marijuana is lumped in with heroin, which I hope all of you know is a killer drug. Do you all know that? Yeah. All right, so we talk about the benefits of marijuana, you know, people liking marijuana, not liking marijuana. Heroin is a killer drug. Fentanyl is even worse. And fentanyl sometimes gets mixed in with the heroin. And we're seeing people all over the country die of horrible numbers. Marijuana is not heroin, it is not fentanyl, it should be not lumped together. And the president now is in the process of removing uh, marijuana from uh, Schedule One, and that is an important step forward. Uh, number two, what he did, I think, is correct in saying that people who were arrested just for possession of marijuana should be pardoned. I agree with that. My own view, and I say this is not, I, you know, not a great fan of drugs and alcohol and all that stuff, anyhow. But I think that for a lot of reasons, we should make marijuana legal in every state in this country. And we are moving actually in that direction, state by state. But the federal government can and should play a role in that process. Okay, other questions from you? I see a hand right back here. Stand up. Yeah, be loud. Yeah. Yeah, just be loud. No, stand up. So, with the fentanyl thing, um, how, how is fentanyl being laced so often? Well, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it, but I think you have disgusting people uh, who could care less about whether you live or you don't. And you have addicts who are shooting up with heroin, and it turns out that there's fentanyl in it, which is incredibly toxic. I mean, you're dealing with people who are murderers, and that's a bit of pushing drugs. Uh, other questions? Okay, do we have one in the back? Okay. Um, Hi, my, my name is Raymond Jolly. I'm the um, senior class treasurer. Um, and my question is, what are your aspirations for and plan of action for the future of climate action in Vermont? Good. Well, it's not just Vermont. Um, look, here is, here is the simple truth. Uh, climate change is very, very real. We are seeing it with our own eyes. And why that is extremely frightening is that when you look at weather patterns, not weather patterns, but climate patterns over a period of time, if you look at them, scientists look at it through the period of hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of years. We are actually seeing climate changes in our own lifetime, year to year. And that means that the problem is progressing in a very radical uh, and forceful way, which should be of concern to everybody. So I happen to agree with scientists who tell us that climate change is an existential threat to not only Vermont, not only America, but to the entire planet. What does that mean? It means that if we do not get our act together very quickly, and we can talk in a moment about how we might do that, what we will see are more droughts, and that impacts food production. Farmers in this country and around the world can't grow food at the quantity they used to if they are existing in a drought situation. You're gonna see more floods. We have seen just this last summer five what they call thousand year floods in the United States. Floods that are supposed to take place. Torrential rainfall, which is supposed to take place once in a thousand years. We saw five of them in this country just in the last summer. We saw unprecedented heat waves in Europe, in China. We are seeing people being forced to leave their land all over the world, Latin America and elsewhere 
because they can't grow crops anymore. They can't find clean drinking water. Everything being equal, unless we not act boldly, that situation is only going to become worse. All right? What should we be doing? Who has thoughts on how we handle uh, the crisis of climate? What ideas do you guys have? I think I see a hand right there in the middle, right in the middle. Yeah, okay. Um, new and different energy sources need to be utilized. Okay. What are some of those energy sources? Uh, nuclear power or um, solar power. All right. Wind, solar, hydropower are three of the maybe best known uh, forms of sustainable energy that do not create carbon. Nuclear is more controversial for a number of reasons, but is also uh, something that people are considering. Uh, the other thing that we have got to do is make our entire economy more energy efficient. What do I mean by energy efficient? What is energy efficiency? Yeah, hand right here. Stand up. Yeah. By energy efficiency, you mean just not wasting a lot of power for very useless things? That's right. I mean, in Vermont, we have a lot of old homes and buildings. And we've spent many millions of dollars making them more energy efficient. That means new insulation, new roofing, new windows. And we have had a, a, a good impact. In Burlington, as a matter of fact, for many, many years, while the city expanded, we have not been utilizing more electricity precisely because of energy efficiency uh, projects. And that's what we've got to do all over the country. What about transportation? What's the direction that we're moving in in terms of transportation to cut carbon emissions? Yeah, uh, let me get some more hands here, guys. I'm just seeing a relatively few people. What are we doing in transportation? Uh, my name is Lucas Stray, and uh, we're turning from gas uh, powered car to electric cars. Right, exactly. And transportation. Right. So the goal is to kind of electrify uh, our transportation system, make more investments in mass public transportation buses. Uh, and an improved uh, rail system. That's some of what we're doing uh, there. Uh, all right, what other questions do you guys have? Um, all right, I see a question right here. Yeah. All right, my name is Dante. Um, I'm a junior, and I got to ask you because my dad was a crowd. But what do you think we're going to do about the race, like the racial injustice within the, the, the government? You know what I'm saying? Like, the police system. Well, I think what we want to do uh, in general, it goes without saying that we want to wipe out all forms of bigotry in this country. Uh, in this country, it goes without saying, so I think all of you know, has a long history of racism. Uh, we have a history of sexism, we have a history of homophobia, we have a history of xenophobia. In terms of police departments, I think we need good Policing all over this country, we have crime problems. We want to have a strong police department, but these police departments cannot be racist in their nature. And I think we're making some progress in that uh, direction. I think the other thing we want to do with policing is have community policing. And there's a movement afoot. For example, a lot of the issues that police deal with are people who are addicted to drugs, people who have mental health problems. A lot of people in jail are there because they were addicted to drugs and have mental health problems. And police need help and support from people who know how to deal with it. Those are not necessarily uh, police problems. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Stand up. Yeah, just be loud. Uh, do you think the foster care system can have these small Do I think the what? I, the question is, do I think the foster care system is doing enough? It is, uh, my wife used to have foster care system, so I've heard a little bit about it. Um, I, I can't give you a definitive answer about how well they're doing. It is a very, I, I can tell you this, 
It is a very painful and difficult situation. I cannot tell you how many moms I have bumped into and said, why did they take my child away from me? Right? So for the government to take a child away from a parent is a big, big decision. And it is traumatic for the parent, it is traumatic for the kids. The reason the state does it is the conclusion is reached that the parent may be alcoholic, addictive, simply a bad parent. But it is a very difficult and has to be really thought out because for the child and for the parent, uh, this is very difficult stuff. And, and obviously we want the care the children get with the foster homes or wherever to be of higher quality if, 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 uh, if, if we can bring it down. Got a question here. Okay. I'm Ben, I'm a senior, and uh, we talked about marijuana, but what can we do on a local and national level to address opioids and fentanyl, especially heroin? I mean, believe me, people have been asking that question for decades without coming up with any brilliant ideas. I think, you know, the easy answer, which I think is widespread agreement, is for a start to do a lot better job in prevention. And that means you. And that means that somebody starts offering you drugs, be smart enough to tell them you choose not to die or end up in jail. All right? And if you can stop, you know, people, if we can stop the buying of drugs, that's a really good start. And I just hope all of you are smart enough to understand that. Once you get hooked into that stuff, I think there are just a few end results. You die, you end up in jail, or you end up addicted and in really bad shape. The ending is not good, and I hope you're smart enough to understand that. Number two, for those people who are addicted, addiction is a bitch of a problem. It is very, very hard. Do we have, we do better in Vermont than most states do, but not good enough. Getting people off of drugs, or for that matter, off of alcohol, is not easy. The addiction is very powerful. So we gotta do a better job in treatment. Thirdly, in terms of the opioids, you have companies like Purdue Pharma and Johnson & Johnson who knowingly were selling opiates. So a lot of people get addicted, let's say I have a shoulder problem, I have a knee problem. Go to the doctor, the doctor say I have something to alleviate your pain, here's an opiate. And too many of these opiates were given out and people start getting addicted to them. And what some of these major companies did is instead of saying, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? What they did is started selling more and more of them. And companies like Purdue and Johnson & Johnson were fined billions and billions and billions of dollars for knowingly selling opioids that were used really as drugs. And we've got to make sure that pharmaceutical companies do not continue to do that. Uh, this is a tough issue. Law enforcement perspective, it is also very, very difficult. So gotta, the answer is a multi-pronged approach, starting with people saying, I'm not gonna get hooked on, on drugs or uh, other addictive drugs. Yeah. Question over here. Hi, um, I'm Grace Barber, I'm a junior. So I have a Colleges I want to go to, I'm looking at colleges I can afford. Um, and I'm not saying like paying off our student debts or paying off our college debt, but what are we going to do about making okay. college more affordable for everybody? Good. All right. We came, in my view, right, let me back this up a little bit. A hundred years ago, 120 years ago, kids of your age were not sitting in high school. They were working on farms, working in factories, working in fields, unless your family had a lot of money. And 100 plus years ago, people say, well, you know, that's not right, it's not fair. They're just wealthy families can send their kids to school. We gotta make public schools, we gotta create public schools, make them available to all. That was a big deal back then. In my view, because the world has changed, technology has changed, if you guys are gonna go out and get a decent job, you need a good education, which includes a higher education. 
So I personally believe that we should make public colleges and universities tuition free. All right, that's my view. Because I think it's important for the country that every young person, and not only young people, have the opportunity to get all the education they need so they can go out and get the good jobs that they want. Right now, as you indicate, the cost of college is extremely high. The result of that is that many hundreds of thousands of bright young people do not go to college, even though they have the capability of getting a higher education. They're doing well in school. And even equally alarming, that 45 million people who are leaving school with student debt. You want to become a doctor. It is not uncommon for somebody to leave medical school with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. That is absurd. So I think we gotta take some radical action, make public colleges and universities tuition free, and cancel all student debt. That's what I do. Got a question here? Okay. You have a question. Got a question up here. From my knowledge of the law enforcement industry, some part-time dispatchers or dispatchers in general are making more than law enforcement officers who are risking their lives every day. Do you think that law enforcement officers should be paid more for the duty that they are providing to the community and risking their lives every day? Then, uh, then I'm sorry, law enforcement, you're comparing them to who? Just in general, I just- Yeah, of course, I think that in terms of law enforcement, what you want is a well-trained, well-paid, professional operation. That's what you want. Uh, I was a mayor for eight years in Berlin, so I got to know a lot of police officers. And it's a difficult job. The scheduling is very difficult. Pay, in many cases, is not good. People live under a lot of stress. Divorce rates are very, very high. Police and police work is difficult. As we indicated, you want a police law that is not racist, that treats everybody the same. It's got to be professional, well-trained, well-paid. Uh, that is my view. Yeah, question right here. Um, my name is Nicholas Segura, um, and I, I just want to get your opinion on border control, and specifically, um, the South Border, and especially with the controversy with Marcus Vineyard and yeah. all that. Look, we have a, in the United States and around the world, we have very serious problems of people migrating out of very poor countries. So what's the problem? And it's not an easy problem. And it exists all over the world. If you're living in Honduras right now, living in parts of Mexico, living in Colombia, it is likely that you are living in a family that has very little money, uh, and where the situation may be coming worse if you're into agriculture because of climate, and you can't even stay on your farm. You may be living in a community where you have drug cartels that are killing people right and left. All right? You're living in a very bad situation, and then you look north a thousand miles, you see the United States of America, where the standard of living is 10 times higher than where you are. So what you are seeing is large numbers of people saying, I don't care what the risk is, I don't care what it takes, I'm getting out of this place because I don't want to raise my kids here. And they're going in large numbers north. That's happening in the United States, it is happening all over Europe. It is happening all over the world. People are leaving and going. So you have a real problem with the water. Now, what the law is, if you, you know, we have immigration laws. The United States cannot simply open its border and allow people in. On the other hand, you cannot demonize people because they're fleeing terrible conditions. Ultimately, the solution is, in my view, people would rather stay in their communities. You think it's easy to leave, say, Honduras, Colombia, or any place? Pick up, not know the language, not have any money, come to the United States? No, that is terrible. The goal is to see how we work with those governments, which is not easy, to improve life for the people there so they don't have to leave in the first place. But I think when you have governors trying to make a political point, try to gain votes by treating people and saying we're going to just use them you know, for, you know, for, for the TV cameras, pick them up and drop them off 
in, in Martha's Vineyard or someplace else. That is, I, I think, contemptuous behavior for those people who are just being pawns in some politician's game. It is a difficult problem. And anyone who thinks they have an easy answer, you know, many of the problems we're talking about, whether it is climate, whether it's healthcare, whether it's immigration, these are not easy, easy problems. Uh, but what, one of the things you do not want to do, I think in this case, is demonize desperate people uh, who are just trying to create a decent life for their kids. Okay, other country, other questions? Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah, Jeff, yeah, right here. Yes. Um, um, my name is Elijah, um, and I, I have a few questions, so I'm going to try and like group them into one. But um, do you see like any future improvement or have any plans for like proper um, access to mental health care in the U.S.? Yes. Look, when we talk about health care, uh, to my mind, mental health is an integral part of health care. It's not something that's separate. So you break your leg and God's love, you got a health problem, but you got a mental health issue, well that's, that's not really a health problem. Of course it is a health problem. And for a variety of reasons, we do not have anywhere near the capabilities that we need to deal with the mental health crisis in America. Now we've had this crisis for a long time. It has been made worse, much worse by the pandemic for a lot of reasons. Maybe some of you can talk to me about that. Uh, you're back in school this year. You weren't in school on a regular basis last year, right? All right, and that's tough. You know, if you're a teenager, you, know, you want to be with your friends. You want to be in school, and yet you are forced to be, you know, who wants to wall read it? Just talk a little bit about what the pandemic has meant uh, for you guys on a personal level. Who wants to say a word on that? Yeah. Stand up. Get up. So, um, I moved to Vermont, like, right when the pandemic got started. So I already was having a hard time with the whole transition. But with the pandemic, it was so much harder because you couldn't go out and you couldn't do anything. So that had a huge impact on my mental health, which, yeah. All right, All right. And, and you're speaking for many, many people. I was up in the Northeast Kingdom uh, a number of months ago. I talked to a, a young lady. I mean, just one of the examples of what the pandemic does. She loves her grandmother very much. Grandmother was in a nursing home. She was unable to visit her grandmother. And that hurt her and upset her very, very much. All right, pandemic, how has it impacted you guys? Yes, right here. Um, for me personally, it was very hard for educational. Uh, like, I know learning online is ideal for anyone, and so it was very hard trying to learn how to do anything on a computer without any human interaction or learning anything by hand. No, no question about it. All across this country, I mean, you should all know this. I mean, your generation was hit hard. Younger kids were hit hard, missed a lot of school. And that's just the academic part. Then you got the socialization part. If you're not around your friends, you're playing ball, you're in music or in choir, you're not doing that. All right, any other thoughts on the pandemic? Looks like we'll take one more. Oh, all right, one second, one second, one second, please. Pandemic. Oh. Uh, something about the pandemic that has really made me think was that not only like time was taken from us, but also like the motiva our motivation levels just dropped rapidly for many of us. And I think that really affected the way that we uh, really learn. Why, why was that? Explain to me. What do you mean your motivation levels? Uh, by motivation, like, I mean, because we weren't allowed to do anything. We were so limited to a certain degree that we couldn't do this. We couldn't, like, see our friend. We couldn't see our family. We felt so helpless that it really made us feel that we just couldn't do anything. And I think that made us turn to, like, maybe bad habits, possibly. And that it really built up a lot of emptiness to some people, like it really made people depressed, which also played in the motivation part. Um, but I, I think the point that I want to make on the pandemic is, is you should understand this. This is going on all over the world. It's going on all over this country. And don't think if, if you describe your experience, 
it is an experience that millions of other people have gone through as well. It is tough. This has been a very tough time. So don't be hard on yourselves. If you feel in a certain way, you know what? It's reality. You were taken out of school. You were isolated. You couldn't see your friends. You couldn't do your academic work. You worried about getting into college and all that stuff. So that's real. So don't be hard on yourself you know, if you, you know, feel depressed about it. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we don't know what the future brings us, but hopefully the situation is getting better. I would not have been here a year ago. You would not have uh, been here with me. So we're making some progress. And I can tell you that you've got five people who are working very, very hard on what we call universal vaccines which will hopefully be able to prevent uh, outbreaks of the pandemic in the future, no matter what the variant uh, might be. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we have uh, advanced, um, come a long way. Right now, as you know, there are treatments available, which there were. So not only the vaccines, but treatments are making some progress. But it would be hard to deny that your generation uh, has gone through a very, very tough period and don't be hard. Uh, on yourself so you feel better. All right, let me take another question of Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah. I was uh, wondering what your stance was on Proposal 5, the upcoming voting for um, individual rights for reproduction. Yeah, I strongly support a woman's right to control her own body. Uh, I think the Supreme Court's decision was very insulting to the women of this country. It's hard to believe that in the year 2022, women uh, cannot make a choice. It's a very difficult choice. It's a personal choice. It is women's choice. And, and I hope all of the men will stand with the women on this uh, issue. <laughs> all right. Uh, other questions? Looks like we got time for one more question. Uh, uh, who wants to ask the question? Who else? Okay. Um, my more in addition to the question that was just asked, do you think that post um, Roe v. Wade being overturned, that it will lead to other groups being targeted? Look, without getting too political here, you've got a group of politicians who don't have the courage to take on the big money interests who control our economic and political life. They don't do that. So to get votes, what they do, and this is what demagogues always do, you pick on particular groups, often minority groups, people who don't have a lot of political power. So if your question is, do I think they may go after gay marriage, is that your implication? Yeah, I do. Uh, and I think we should be very conscious of what they are trying to do and make sure that they do not get away with that. You are living in a state, by the way, that has been a leader uh, both on women's rights and on gay rights in the country. We should be very proud of that. Uh, so I think it's not going to happen in this state, but uh, you have a legitimate fear that it may happen uh, elsewhere. Um, all right, I think I'm probably going to have to uh, move on. Uh, let me just conclude. Uh, by first of all, thanking you all for your excellent questions and your uh, participation uh, in the discussion. Uh, and to suggest to you uh, that politics in a democracy is not some kind of abstraction. It's not somebody else doing it. What democracy is supposed to mean is that we are all in this together, that we are all participating, that we're trying to figure out answers to very difficult problems and doing it in a civil way. It is quite legitimate and right that people have different points of view. Respect other people's point of view. But my main message is the country today faces a lot of challenges. That's no great secret. We need all of you and your brains and your energy to help us solve those problems and to go forward. Thank you all very much.